guys, today your video is going to be over chapter 5, which is more applications of forces. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about friction, about drag forces, about centripetal forces, and about how to handle uh, banked curve problems. So a few of these things will be new uh, from last year, but um, some of it will be a review. So this is the part that's a review. We have two different kinds of friction. We have static and kinetic, right? So the coefficient of friction, which is this guy right here and right here, it's a ratio between the friction that's present and the normal force that's acting on the object. So the two kinds of friction, static and kinetic, static represents the friction that needs to be overcome in order to start the object moving. And then kinetic friction represents the friction that's present while the object is already in motion. These coefficients are dimensionless, right? But your friction and your normal force both should be measured in newtons. All right, so let's take a look at a friction example. Uh, we have a situation with a um, sled being pulled across the ground. It's being pulled at a rope that makes an angle of 40 degrees. Um, so let's go ahead and draw a free body here for our sled. Uh, we have the weight of the sled going down. We have this applied force going up, a normal, and now we have a frictional force present. They're telling us that the static and kinetic friction is 0.2 and 0.15, respectively. So we need to find the frictional force exerted by the ground and the acceleration, ooh, not of the children, just of Nathan. It's a typo. Um, and the sled, starting from rest, and we have two different tensions in our rope. So we're going to start with 200 first, and this is 40 degrees. So the first thing we need to determine is if our sled is even going to move, meaning if the applied force here is going to be large enough to overcome our static frictional force. So let's find our applied force in the x direction, which we're just going to call fx, and that would be 200 cosine 40 for this case. And that is 153 newtons. Now we need to find our frictional, our static frictional force. If our static frictional force is less than this, the object will move and we can find um, our acceleration. So we need to find our normal in order to do that, right? This weight is going to be 900 newtons because that's the sled plus Nathan times 10. And then your normal force is going to be the difference between 900 and whatever this y component is. So let's find our y component here. Oh, that's sine. That would be 129. So our normal force then is going to be 771 newtons. So our coefficient of static is the frictional static force divided by your normal. So we have 0.2 equals static friction over 771. So that gives us a frictional force of 150. So just barely, but no. So for part A, our frictional force is 154, and our acceleration will be zero because we didn't apply enough horizontal force here to overcome the static frictional force. All right, so let's do the second part. What happens if your um, tension now is 240 instead of uh, 200. Now we're going to have a larger horizontal force, right, which should result in some acceleration for us. So, uh, this is 240. So now our horizontal force is 240 cosine 40. 
which gives us a horizontal force of 184. Our Y component is 154 here. So that gives us a normal of 746. So um, once we determine that it's going to move, which hopefully if I did my math right, it will Oops. point to and frictional over 746. 746 times point 0.2. Yes, our static frictional force is 149.2. So once we do that and we determine that it is going to move, um, then we need to find whatever our kinetic friction is. So we've made that distinction. So now our kinetic friction is Fk over Fn. So that would be 746 now times 0.15 because our coefficient is 0.15. So our frictional force is 112 newtons. So for B, 112 newtons is our friction. And our acceleration, um, our X force is 184. And our frictional force is 112. So to find our net, we're just going to subtract those two. We get 72.1 for our net force. And our mass is 90. So 72.1 divided by 90 gives us an acceleration of 0.8 meters per second squared. So a review of circular motion, remember that um, an object traveling in a circle, if it keeps a constant speed, um, it's still going to be accelerating because the direction is changing. So your velocity vector is not changing its magnitude, it's just changing the direction that it points. And your centripetal acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle. So this is a C. Because the centripetal acceleration is directed towards the center, so is the centripetal force. That stands for center-seeking force. And remember that centripetal force is your mass times your centripetal acceleration. Um, and your centripetal acceleration is provided by this formula right here. Here is um, a way to find your velocity of an object that's traveling in a circle right, because velocity is change in distance over time. So when you're traveling in a circle, the distance that you're traveling is the circle's circumference, so that becomes your change in x. And the time becomes what we call the period, which is a capital T. And period is the time for one revolution. So when we find our circular velocity here, we're finding the, the time it takes for it to go around the circle one time. Okay, so this is a conceptual example here for centripetal motion, uh, kind of, sort of. You're swinging a pail of water in a vertical circle with radius r. The speed of the pail is v at the top. So if we draw a free body for what's happening at the top of our circle, this is top. We're going to have the weight of the pail of water, and then we also have the tension force from the rope pulling it down. And then if we look at what's happening at the bottom, we have the weight of the pail going down and then the tension force in the rope actually pulling it upwards, right? So for part A, I'm asking to find the tension force in the rope at the top of the circle. So let's look here. Our free body for what's happening at the top, since I have two forces pointing in the same direction, the weight plus the tension equals are MA. Now, in this case, um, it's moving in a circle, so it's in centripetal acceleration. So it would be mg plus t equals mv squared over r. So to find our tension, we just subtract our weight from both sides. That's your answer. And then for part B, find 
the minimum value of V for the water to remain in the pail. Okay, so when a s uh, something is traveling in like a vertical circle like this, like spinning in this direction, at the top, the minimum amount of force to keep it going in a circle is going to be equal to whatever the object's weight is, right? If it is spinning slower here than what it takes to equal this, we're going to have problems. Um, it's not going to be able to make it over or to make it crest the force of gravity, and so it won't make a complete circle if this is not fast enough. So this is your relationship for part B. So that means that the minimum speed uh, ends up being the square root of gr. So in this case, um, it didn't really end up depending on the mass. It depends on your acceleration due to gravity and the size of the circle that you're trying to make. And then for part C, tension force at the bottom. Well, at the bottom, this is our free body, so we have tension minus the weight gives us our centripetal force. And then our tension would be those two added together instead of uh, subtracted like they were over here. Okay, I think I'm going to save the rest of this video for the um, next time. We will just focus on um, centripetal force and friction uh, when I see you guys this on Monday.